Hello everybody, Dark Skeleton here, and in this video I wanted to talk about the five best Un'Goro Hearthstone Legendaries. Now that the set's been out for a while, we've seen how the decks have played out, and searching cards ended up being insanely good in this expansion set, uh, some of which I actually didn't think would be as amazing as they are. Uh, and one of those is the Caverns Below, which is the rogue quest. Everybody who's been playing the expansion should be very familiar with it by now, because a lot of rogues are running around playing this deck. So the idea here is you play four minions of the same name, basically. You make a bounce deck where you play the same card over and over again, off the field or in your hand, and you get the Crystal Core, where you pay five mana, and for the rest of your game, uh, all your minions are five fives, and they can't be hexed down, because the hexed frog becomes a five five. They can't really be devolved, because they'll still be five fives. It's hard to deal with crystal core minions outside of a five damage AoE. And uh, this deck ended up being very powerful, uh, not only because those minions end up becoming five fives, and of course you play cheap minions, but also certain variants of it, I would say probably the better ones, um, can play charge minions like Patches and South Sea Deckhand, in order to do insane amounts of damage on one turn. So, for instance, uh, South Sea Deckhand, while you have a dagger equipped, is 5 damage to the face because it's now a 5 5, and you can Shadow Step it to deal another 5 5 uh, of damage, or if you just hold all of your charge minions till the end of the game. Easy to play 6 minions on turn 6 or 7, and they all cost 1 mana, so, well, you can sometimes deal 20 plus damage in one turn, which is absolutely insane. So, the Kevin's Below made an entirely unique rogue archetype, which is insanely awesome. Um, and it's been a very popular and actually fairly competitive uh, deck that rogue players have been enjoying. Next up, Lyra the Sun Shard. I don't think I thought this card was necessarily going to be bad. Uh, I just kind of overlooked its potential. Um, so this is a 5 mana 3-5, Lyra the Sun Shard, Elemental. Uh, whenever you cast a spell, add a random priest card to your, or priest spell to your hand. Which means, in theory, you can keep cycling through spells until you get some kind of insane effect going on. Um, now what makes this card really good is if you can get out the Radiant Elementals, a common from the set, uh, in the same turn that you have Live at the Sun Shard, because a lot of Priest spells actually only cost one or two mana, or even zero mana in the case of cards like Silence and Circle of Healing. So, having that combo on the field can sometimes mean you just win the game, um, obviously you're looking at cards like Divine Spirit, Inner Fire, um, Potion of Madness, which are all good cards to get off of Live of the Sun Shard, but also good cards to play with Live of the Sun Shard. So you can actually do a crazy amount of damage as a priest, sometimes getting one turn kills with that kind of playstyle. But even if you just have the card as a, basically a standalone, if you cast any amount of spells, it's still a 3-5, which is a 4 mana body, but you just pay one more mana to basically draw as many priest spells as you want, and the potential of that goes from really good to game-breakingly good. Plus it's an elemental, so there has been a little bit of priest synergy there. Um, elemental priest, not really a thing, but uh, not a bad tag to have as an extra. There's actually no downside to it being an elemental. And uh, Light of the Sun Shard is just a really competitive priest card and goes into a lot of priest decks, if not pretty much all of them. I haven't looked at the deck lists exactly, but you see this card a lot. It's great. So next up, Sunkeeper Terim. This is probably one of my favorites from the set and also one of the best cards in the set. At first glance, you look at it and you're like, yeah, it's a 6 mana 3-7 and it sets all other minions to 3-3s. That includes your opponent's minions, so you can theoretically buff your opponent's minions and it's a taunt. Um, but if you get past that, you can think about Paladins. Paladins having the 1-1 one, one Silverhand Recruits, meaning you make them 3-3s and it's kind of like a Quartermaster. You can also notice that it has 7 health and 3 attack, making it perfect for countering enemy 3-3s. And you also keep in mind the fact that when you do play a Paladin deck, especially a lot of these popular control ones, you don't have to play the Sunkeeper Terrain on turn 6. In fact, it's often not going to be the right play. Well, a lot of the time it is, but a lot of the time it's not. So just hold it until you have the right moment where you gain a big stat lead over your opponent, so you nerf some of the big minions down. Basically, anything big they play will get absolutely shattered by Sunkeeper Terrain. And it's a solid body, too. I mean, 6 mana, 3, 7 taunt, that's not too bad on its own, but you almost always want to play it as a nerf to your opponent's minions or a buff to your own, or both. But in any case, it's crazy good. And a really excellent discover off of the Stonehill Defender, I might add. Stonehill Defender, crazy good in Paladin. So, 
Awesome card. I really love this one. Happy I got it in a pack. And it's a great card for this set. So another really good one from this set, but not quite at the top of the list because there are actually control decks that don't play Fire Plume's Heart. But Fire Plume's Heart, uh, if you play enough taunt minions, you get rewarded with Sulphurus, which has the notable effect of giving you Vagnaros' hero power, um, no longer being able to gain armor, so dangerous if you are low on HP, but really good at defeating other control decks because eventually that hero power will just outvalue just about any deck. So a great card to have versus control decks, really flipping how Warrior can play against control decks from something that eventually loses because they have a weak hero power against opponents that aren't attacking their own face, to something that makes them uh, basically the late, late, late game deck. However, uh, Fire Plume's Heart does have some weaknesses in that if an, a deck is aggressive enough, uh, something like the mid-range hunters, that just kill them before they get self for us out, then all the Fire Plume's Heart has done is lost them uh, one card during the game and forced them to play more taunt minions, some of which may not be the absolute best uh, warrior cards out there, um, which does, it makes it weaker versus aggro, and that's a big deal because there's a lot of aggro in the meta right now. So in some cases, a warrior deck that just does not play Fire Plume's Heart may be better, um, where you just want to purely focus on winning those aggro matchups, but it's a really solid card. It's definitely created a unique uh, warrior archetype and it's very hard to defeat this deck as if you're playing another control deck. Okay, and finally for this video, Kalismos Primal Lord. The reason this is in the number five spot is not that it's necessarily weaker than the other ones. Kalismos is actually a crazy powerful card, um, basically making the Elemental Shaman almost good enough to be played. But why it's at the lower end of the list um, is because the Elemental Shaman hasn't seen so much play at the higher ranks. Um, usually what people are doing from what I've seen in tournament videos is playing more of a aggressive shaman that happens to play some, the good jade cards, jade lightning, eye of black paw, and then maybe something like bloodlust, um, just beating out the elemental shaman decks. But this card, it's very versatile. Uh, obviously you have to play the elemental decks in order to make it work, but getting a three damage AOE to your opponent's minions being able to heal yourself for 12, good visits, uh, mage decks for instance, or being able to even fireball the opponent's face uh, as you play this card as a finisher in some circumstances is really good. And the ability to summon a bunch of 1-1 tokens isn't bad either, it basically becomes an 8 mana Anixia, Anixia normally 9 mana. Um, in any case, it's a really powerful card, there's no doubt about that. It's just that Elemental Shaman isn't quite at the power level to make it into the most competitive decks, so it's really good, but it hasn't made that archetype good enough. So that's going to be it for this video on the five most powerful Angoro legendaries. Uh, obviously, a lot of these cards have kind of created their own archetypes to play around, which is really cool. I like that a lot. That's what I expected quests to be. I just wish that more of the quests were actually viable enough to be played. Um, but that's going to be it for this video. So I've been Dark Skeleton. Thanks for watching, and I will see you guys in my future Hearthstone content.